I'd like to uh, thank all of you uh, for coming this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful day, and uh, everybody has other things to do, but this is important too. As I mentioned, we had a very large crowd here last night, about 140 people. So, um, so nice to be able to spread out um, just a little bit. Um, we're being uh, videoed today. Walt Custer is here to do a video, and we're also um, um, I'm going to offer those videos to people who cannot attend uh, starting sometime late, later next week. Um, just a couple of announcements um, to begin with. Um, if you would please uh, take a minute and quiet your communications devices. I always need to remind people about that. For those of you who don't know, restrooms are across the plaza here. And just one more thing unrelated to the meeting today. Um, we're still a fair distance from the quorum um, for our annual election. So if you have not put your ballots um, in the mail, if you would do so as soon as possible, that would be great. I'd sleep better at night if I knew I didn't have to do the election over again. So um, um, I'm hoping to look at a quorum by the end of next week. As you know, we're gathered here tonight today, <laughs> whatever, and both actually, um, to learn more about the dead and dying tree problem um, along the coast. The death of our trees seems to be a, relevant, a relatively recent series of events that, that may be getting worse. Right now there are probably more questions than answers, so we're going to spend some time today exploring more about what we know and what we don't know about our changing landscape. We're fairly early in our project. As the Sea Ranch is still trying to get its arms around our, the causes of the problem and what, if anything, we can do about it. It's also a long term problem that's not likely to abate anytime soon. So we may be um, in this, uh, dealing with this issue for, for some time to come. Um, last night, the point was made on several occasions that, in some respects, this is an opportunity um, to re examine our landscape and re examine um, some of the things that are going on in our environment. And because we're going to be in this for a long time, um, um, planning our response um, is important. Uh, with all that in mind, we're working um, with our staff and with a variety of experts from other places to better understand the problems and to plan our long-term response. Fortunately, there is a growing body of scientific research being done, and we're lucky to have um, um, part of those research teams here tonight, or today. I keep saying that. It's okay. It's important to remember that much of what's happening um, is a coastal problem, not just a sea ranch problem. Um, we're just a piece of a greater puzzle, and you're going to see that in great detail today. Um, as for the sea ranch, we've um, increased our budget to deal with removal of more and more dead and dying trees. Um, but there's a whole lot more to this problem than money. We need to better understand what's going on. We need to implement uh, mitigation plans that consider other aspects of the environment such as cleanup, habitat, and the potential for replanting, um, and maybe even some permitting issues along the way. To those ends, the association will again um, reach out to several of our environmental consultants, um, including a, a professor of forestry, Joe McBride, who's worked on uh, Sea Ranch for many, many years, um, as well as the, uh, WRA um, environmental consultants out of um, San Rafael. Um, they helped us with our fiber optic project and the environmental work of the water company's capital improvement project. So they're very familiar with the Sea Ranch and highly experienced environmental consultants. Um, they'll be um, working with us going forward. Um, we'll be using the upcoming year to um, work with our um, resources to uh, better understand the decline of many of our trees and to plan the future of our landscape. Most of the work done by TSRA will be on commons, however, our trees don't always understand property lines, so much of what you hear today may be uh, valuable for private owners as well. Um, we have actually entered into some partnerships with private owners, and when we're working on commons in one area, um, we're happy to work on private lots and then build the owner back for that work. Sometimes it's a little cheaper to do it that way. And we've had. Um, a dozen or so of those very successful partnerships with the membership. 
So, um, without sounding too much like CNN, I'd like to introduce uh, a couple of our early speakers. The way the uh, program works today is um, we have several presentations to go through. Um, that's going to take about an hour and a half. Um, again, there will be a lot of slides and you may want to slide forward um, so you can see them all, but they're going to show you a lot of pictures of, of what's going on um, with our trees. So um, the rolling um, slides here are just taken on the Sea Ranch. Other pictures um, um, won't be um, necessarily on the Sea Ranch. Um, can we go in the same order uh, today, Chris? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd first like to introduce uh, Chris Lee. Chris works for um, Cal Fire. Um, he's based in Fortuna, also part of the research team. He's a registered professional forester and works in the area of forest pathology. And I didn't know until yesterday that there was such a thing as forest pathology. Um, but it's a lot like human pathology, um, except it's not as gory. <laughs> so um, Chris will have a presentation, uh, then I'll introduce uh, Professor Tom Gordon from UC Davis, and then we'll go back to Chris. Uh, um, for a second presentation. So, Chris, come on up and uh, do your thing. Right, let me load the, oh, okay. the talk. While you're doing that, um, take just a minute to introduce some other people. Uh, Tito Patry um, is here on the panel. Tito is a landscape architect practicing in San Francisco. He's been on the TSRA design committee since 1995, mm -hmm. um, so he's been around. And uh, he's currently chair of the committee. Um, it's nice to have uh, Tito up here, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some design committee issues um, later on. Um, also at the table is Alexis Rose. Um, Alexis is a staff member. She has a presentation, short presentation in a little while. Uh, Alexis is working on um, a um, uh, working on some of our databases. She manages our heritage resource database and um, creates an inventory of historical, architectural, and ecological elements here on the Sea Ranch. Um, she sort of develops these digital tools and systems to help us um, more effectively steward our shared landscape, and you'll see some of the stuff that, that she's been working on um, here as we start to map our uh, dead and dying trees. You ready? What I don't know is how to do the clicker. Well, I don't know. Let's see what it looks like. It must be an on button somewhere. Yeah, I thought there would be an on button. <laughs> yeah, it's got the little thing in there. Is that going to the computer? Okay. Oh, this is just a whole thing. Aha. Perfect. How many experts does it take? Hey, well, I'm definitely not one of them. Before you say it's going to try it. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thank you for giving up part of your morning to um, come hear some, some observations and see some pictures um, and absorb some additional information about um, what's going on with trees here at the Sea Ranch and at other parts of the coast north and south here. I want to talk first about pine trees and we'll spend a good amount of time on pine trees and then later on I'm going to also talk about sudden oak death um, and those are just two of, of several other things that may be going on. Um, the, the, the issue with pine trees is one of the more amorphous and sort of puzzling aspects of you know some things we can we can clearly identify what's going on with bishop pines with monterey pines with short pines up and down the coast is a little bit more confusing and there certainly may be more than one thing going on i got involved looking at pine trees as soon as i was hired at cal fire four years ago um, my predecessor at cal fire who worked out of ukiah as well as the university of california cooperative extension advisor greg juicy um, who worked out of Ukiah as well. Um, they both told me that there's, there's this problem going on with Bishop Pines dying. And their focus of concern was uh, around the Fort Bragg area. And in the course of extending the um, search for what was going on with pine trees, it became evident that stuff was going on um, also down here um, in the south. 
And so I initiated an effort to get some money to maybe start to do some research about this. And so I want to describe the preliminary stages of that research. So what I'm going to be talking about is sort of what are the characteristics of some of these um, declines that we see in pine trees. Um, just a really brief background slide on some pine problems elsewhere because some of them are reminiscent of what we see here. Um, what, what some of the patterns specifically look like around here at Fort Bragg. Um, and what are some of the things that we see when we actually go look at the trees? What could be contributing to this decline? What are some of the pieces of the puzzle? And if I go fast or skip some things, um, if anything's not clear, um, yell at me and let me know and I'll try to um, fill in. <clears throat> so, um, yes, sir? So, are you going to talk about the relationship between this and sudden death or how pervasive species-wise this is? Is it particular to our pines or is it likely to spread? Well, I mean, I'll try to address some of that, but there's an awful lot. We really are at the beginning stages, and it takes sometimes decades to understand what's going on with these things. Um, you know, up in Alaska, there was a similar decline in yellow cedars that they have finally figured out the causes of they think. And they can actually replicate it in the lab. But it took 15 or 20 years at least for them to figure that out. And that was just one, you know, focused on this one particular tree species. And the problems with the pine decline may also affect other trees. And there may be kind of synergies between different things going on, and so it may be a more complicated picture here. So, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to give the whole picture, um, but I will try to, to make connections where I can. Um, it, it has been noted uh, for at least 15 years, um, maybe a little bit longer, um, that's when some observers up in Fort Bragg started noticing that, hey, we have not just a, an individual bishop pine here or there dying, but we have these big patches of pine dying. What is going on? And people started to speculate um, what it could be. Um, and then uh, individual people may have noticed some similar things down here, but um, what was told to me when I first started to embark on a project of looking at the pine trees more closely was, oh, the trees down at Salt Point State Park are big and healthy, they're in great shape, they would be good ones to use as a control or a comparison to the ones at the Fort Bragg. So go check those out. And then within the first year or two of trying to study them, the ecologist for State Park said, actually, it's not true. Those stands are starting to deteriorate really rapidly. Um, and so um, it, it doesn't, the more that I go out into Bishop Pine stands and look around, the worse the stands tend to look to me. Um, so that it's difficult to find those healthy stands for comparison. Um, around Fort Bragg, there are several large patches of dead trees, acres and acres in some places. Down here, there are some patches like that, and I'll show a picture of one of them. I'm sure that some of you have noticed up and down Highway 1 where some of those patches are. But there are also areas like um, large stretches of Salt Point State Park where there's a more overall <coughs> decline in tree condition so that the forest doesn't die out in one big patch. There might be a dead tree here, a dead tree there, and then other trees start to look ragged over time, and eventually the stand just doesn't look good. Um, another thing that became evident was that um, this wasn't limited to bishop pine, that it's also a problem with Monterey pine in some places and with short pine in some places. So here's one of those large mortality patches just north of Anchor Bay. Um, many of you have probably noticed this one. I mean, everything is dead. It's very barren at this point, although there are shrubs coming up in the understory. Here's one in Fort Bragg that has been dead for so long that most of the trees have fallen down. And this was actually a mixed stand of Monterey pine, shore pine, and bishop pine. There are still a few scraggly shore pines, like there's one behind this dead tree, this one right here. Um, they don't look great, but they're still alive. Um, but most of the Monterey pines and bishop pines are dead there. Here's one of the areas where the decline is more <coughs> scattered. So you have individual dead pines. And not all of the gray that you see there are actually completely dead trees. Some of them just have maybe 80% of their crown is dead or 90%. 
Um, and then you can see the red colors where individual branches on other trees are starting to die. And then there are some areas where the majority of trees are still alive, but the crowns are shrinking. They're losing branches and they're losing needles. And, and when you look up, when you stand beneath the trees and you look up through the canopy, you see a lot of sky in between there. There, there are gaps. The canopy is losing its sort of closure and those crowns are shrinking away from each other, getting smaller. Presumably at some point there aren't enough needles to, to photosynthesize enough to really support the mass of the tree and the tree will become vulnerable to a variety of pests or just die at that point. <coughs> Now, um, people have seen pine declines that are somewhat similar in other parts of the world um, for many, many years. And typically, these are really complicated phenomena. So, in the southeastern U.S., we have a problem called little leaf disease, which in many ways, a lot of those declining pines are reminiscent of the ones that we see here. Um, and this is a disease where trees decline, they lose needles, um, they just gradually, over many, many, many years, um, they, they die, and it tends to be in patches. It's related to a variety of things, like these root pathogens. This, this one that's first on the list here, Phytophthora cinnamomi, is an imported pathogen. Um, the, the damage caused by Phytophthora cinnamomi is exacerbated by poor soil drainage, so these really heavy clay soils, low soil nitrogen, and potentially some other pathogens and pests. In the Mediterranean, there's a scotch pine decline that people are primarily linking to extended drought periods and maybe some pests that um, kind of ride on the coattails of the drought problems. And there's not much new pine regeneration going on there. In the Great Lakes region, we have a decline in red pine and what they've seen in those stands is a lot of root infesting pests that bring fungi into the trees that clog up the water system, the water conducting system. And um, there may be some sort of abiotic stress in the background that is making these trees susceptible to these pests because it's not, these aren't pests that you necessarily would expect to be primarily coming in and killing healthy trees. And in the Channel Islands, um, Southern California, there's a, a bishop pine decline going on down there at the southern tip or the southern extent of the distribution of the tree. And one of the main contributors that they have uh, pinned this decline on is um, a lot of moisture stress, water stress, and a lot of that has to do with reduced summertime fog, which is an important source of water for those trees. Um, on the bottom of the slide, I've underlined a sentence that says bark beetle outbreaks, for example, in the southern Sierra Nevada, are not a decline phenomenon like the other pine declines I'm describing here. Instead, those are native pests that um, attack trees on an epidemic scale in response to really severe abiotic stress. So it's something that happens cyclically and has been observed cyclically in California and all across the western U.S. for um, as long as we've been paying attention. Um, our drought this time around was exceptionally long and severe and so it made the bark beetle outbreak exceptionally severe and um, exceptionally big. Um, so that, that's sort of just a natural phenomenon that happens when the environmental conditions get out of whack. You know, balance. What does abiotic stress mean? Abiotic stress is a stress that is not a living thing. So um, not having enough water or temperature <coughs> being too high or being planted in soil that doesn't allow the water to drain correctly or not having enough nutrients, any of those things that aren't a living thing. So, so, so driven by climate change. Well, um, so, like I said, we've seen it happen cyclically, so it's that same old debate about, you know, how, are, is a cycle a cycle that is a natural thing, or are cycles getting out of whack and changing? People will still be debating that for a long time. Um, but it's well known that when there's severe drought in the Sierra Nevada, there will be bark beetle outbreaks. 
So for this study, uh, you know, our initial goals were basically to describe this decline that's going on along the coast. Because sometimes people um, in other parts of California, sometimes in, people in other parts of the world aren't always aware of what's going on here. Um, and people, you know, Bishop Decline or Bishop Pine is such a, a, a rare and restricted sort of species that not everybody knows that it's here either. And so we wanted to document what's going on and try to describe it and to isolate some of those factors that appear to be important so people can study them some more. So we got some funding from the Forest Service. Um, there are a lot of people that have helped out and collaborated and I'm, I'm, I've listed some of those at the end of the talk. And um, now we're in the second year of collecting data and we appreciate that properties like the Sea Ranch, state parks, um, Cal Fire, that have given us access to, to look at trees. Can I ask, have you observed much going on in Point Reyes with the Bishop Pine stand there? <laughs> Absolutely, and Tom will actually address that specifically in his talk, yes. Um, this is a bad map, I, I apologize. It just shows that we have a cluster of study sites that are um, oriented around the Fort Bragg area, and we have another cluster that is oriented down here on Sea Ranch and Salt Point State Park. And we have some plots in the so-called pygmy forest areas and some plots in the mature, large, normal size bishop pine stands. Some of those stands are purely bishop pine, and some of those stands, especially here on Sea Ranch, um, the bishop pine is growing with other tree species like redwoods, mm -hmm. um, for example. Um, and what we do, I, I really skipped, I kind of skipped over the methods um, in, this, in this PowerPoint. So I'll briefly describe what we do is we, we circumscribe plots in these bishop pine stands and we go out and we inventory all the trees, we measure them, and we're trying to get an idea of whether these plots are, there's a lot of tree competition or not a lot of tree competition, how open or how crowded they are. Um, we measure the trees, we, we record their species, and for the pines, we take two cores from um, a selected set of pines, including dead pines, on each site. And then we try to list all the pests and pathogens that we can find on, on the pines. So, trying to get a better description of what's going on. The scale on the left, number of trees, what, what units are those? So that's just, um, I, I would say at this point we've looked at, you know, something like 120 or 150 trees. So that's just, out of that set of 120 or 150, how many, for example, started in the year 1950? About 15 of them. So that's just strictly how many trees we counted start that, that, that got started in that year. In your two sample areas, this data is about your two sample Yes, areas. absolutely, yep. And um, what you see from this, um, looking at the tree cores, is that of the trees, and we're still collecting cores, where we're, our data set is certainly not complete. Um, of the ones that we have collected so far, around two-thirds of them got established between 1935 and 1960. And of the others, about half of them are older than that and about half of them are younger than that. Um, and so this is an interesting thing because when, when I was told about this decline, the hypothesis was, oh, you know, these trees all started out at the same time, they're reaching the end of their life cycle, and they're just naturally falling apart. And we don't have, because we don't have wildfire, and these trees depend on wildfire to get young trees started because you need something to clear out that, that growing space um, and give them bare mineral soil, to give them plenty of, of sunlight. Because of that, we're not getting the new generation coming up. And so that's the crux of the problem. Um, and so, in some ways, this data so far supports that idea, and in some ways it doesn't support it, depending on how you look at it. Um, Two-thirds of them started in roughly that 25-year um, time period. So does that mean that they're all the same generation? You know, would you call that an even-aged cohort? I don't know. It depends on how you label it in some ways. Don't bishop pines need fire to start? They do, um, and there's a, there's a few reasons. They're, they're, they're the kind of pine trees that keep those cones on the branches and they don't open up until there's some heat to release those seeds. And, then, and that can be a really hot day. It doesn't necessarily have to be fire. 
But the other thing that fires do is that they clear out all that stuff that's on the ground. So those seeds will germinate on that bare ground. They can't necessarily germinate when all the other stuff is there. Yeah. Yes? Do you know if the trees uh, on Sea Ranch that are dead and dying were planted? And are they cloned? Um, I, I think some of them were planted and some of them weren't. And I think somebody like Tito can probably answer those questions better than me. So maybe at the end, when we get the yeah. questions and answers. Yeah, if I could interrupt for just a second. Um, in terms of the Q&A, um, this has been, this is a great dialogue and I appreciate that. Um, but up front, the people can't hear the questions in the back. And um, so we do have about half an hour at the end to have Q&A. If you could just maybe jot your questions down and then we can also get it on the, on the recording so that the people who aren't here today um, can take advantage of not only your questions but their responses. Um, and, and I think that way it'll be a little more comprehensive program for us. Thanks, Frank. Um, so moving on, um, the other information we can get from these cores, we can measure these growth rings and we can see if, how the trees have grown over the years. The, the years that they grew really well and added a lot of wood and the trees that they didn't grow, or the years that they didn't grow so well. And um, what we see here is that you have this natural up and down from year to year in growth, which is what you would expect because you have up and down in the um, rainfall, for example, that they get. But at a certain point, it does look like, and this is all our trees from all our sites averaged together, at a certain point, it sure looks like that line did start to go downhill. And it looks like that point for the trees that we've looked at so far is somewhere in the 90s, in the 1990s. And then when you um, look at the condition of the tree crowns, um, the thing that's striking to me, um, I did two things. I rated the overall condition of how dense the crown was. In other words, if you stand underneath the tree and you look up, can you see the sky through that tree crown? Is it completely, is that space completely occupied by needles or are there big gaps in that tree crown? And so I rated it you know, on a scale from zero to 100%. And then I did the same thing with branches that have died back. In that crown, how many bare branches are there that used to have needles? that they've lost them all and died now. Um, and a striking thing to me is that um, very, very few of the crowns of all the trees that I've looked at have been over 60 or 70% full of needles. So it's an overall low um, condition of crown density out there. And this is an example of what I'm talking about. You stand there and you look up through the canopy and you see that some crowns are big, some crowns are small, um, there's a lot of space up there, and there's a lot of uh, bare branches as well. So um, this, is, this is a graph that combines the growth data with some of that crown condition data. So on these, the top uh, graph represents the non-pygmy forest sites. The bottom graph represents the pygmy forest sites that we looked at. And there are some interesting differences in the pattern here. In these graphs, the red uh, line is the line that's representing trees that were either dead when we took the core, or that had a really, the crowns were in really poor condition. And the green lines are those trees where the crowns were in better condition, where my rating was over 50%. Um, and the striking thing here is that the ones that, the, um, that were either dead or their crowns were in bad condition, you can see that they did have precipitous declines in growth. And the pygmy forest sites, the bottom graph in particular, it was kind of interesting because it looked like those trees um, were really growing very fast when they were young. And then for whatever reason, they took it, their growth to the nosedive. And so to get from the data back onto sort of what, what are some of the possible factors that we need to now take this forward and look at more closely? What are some of the things that could be behind this decline? And so I'm going to go from the kind of bigger, coarser scale factors down to the, to the finer scale factors. 
So some of the bigger things that could be lurking in the background here. Have there been some climatic shifts or some climatic changes? Has rainfall changed? Has the amount of fog and the timing of fog delivery changed? Is there more solar exposure to these trees than there used to be? Are the ambient mean temperatures increasing as we go through the decades? Um, any of these things, even a small shift in one of those factors could represent a big stress for trees potentially. Um, that's something that we haven't quite got to the step of starting to um, look at this information, but we're going to get there. Um, another big possible contributor that is related to our presence on the landscape is lack of wildfire. And I know that you've probably heard about this quite a bit. Um, these trees do seem to depend on wildfire in certain ways, especially for regeneration. Um, one thing that I've wondered as I drive up and down the coast is, um, is Monterey pine just as dependent as Bishop pine on wildfire, or is it a little bit less so? Um, is it able to regenerate better without that fire? Um, on the Pygmy Forest sites, interestingly enough, that's where I see the most new young trees. And I suspect it's because there's more bare soil and, and more open conditions in general in those pygmy forest sites. Even though the trees, the, the adult trees, tend to be in worse shape. And then with the lack of wildfire could also come some, some changes in the nutrient pool in the soils too. And over the long term, that can take a toll on trees. So our third category of, of things that could be behind this are pests, and specifically we have lots of native forest pests. So these are things that um, we don't know how long they've been around, but they've been around as long as we've been paying attention to them. Um, and the maybe the most common one that I see is this one, which when we call western gall rust. It's a fungus. It produces spores that fly through the air and affect stems and branches of pine trees and it, and it make these swellings on the trees. And if you look closely at this time of year for sure, because I saw some um, within the past couple of days, if you look closely you may see these yellow patches and those are areas where the fungus is actually producing spores right now and releasing those spores into the air. This is something that um, we've seen, and it hasn't been really considered to be a major problem for pines. Um, what I wonder about this fungus is if uh, as trees get older and older, and especially in very moist locations along the coast, does the, do these infections just accumulate over the years um, to such an extent that eventually they wear the tree down? Um, and it may not be only western gall rust, but other native pathogens like these, the root diseases, which are, again, they're really common. They're often overlooked. They, they often live in tree root systems for maybe decades without producing any kind of sign or symptom that you, you would ever know about. Um, but, again, they're, they're just residents of our ecosystems here. Um, and then, Stem decay fungi, very common in these trees. Um, and again, maybe things that, maybe they accumulate over the years and eventually have a toll that they take on older trees. Um, these infect wounds, they infect dead branch stubs, um, however they can get into tree stems. And then over the years, they gradually colonize more and more of the wood in the tree. And my suspicion is that uh, in our moist, coastal environments that they are um, even more commonly present than they would be on inland locations. And then we have um, a multitude of non-native forest pests that things that, that apparently have been introduced into California. And one of the ones, uh, one of the, the, the categories of non-native forest pests that I've been finding is these oomycete pathogens. These are things that used to be thought of as fungi because they look a lot like fungi. They're microscopic, um, but they behave and they look a lot like fungi. They, they tend to be, with some important exceptions, which I'll talk about in my next talk, um, they tend to be soil inhabiting organisms. They tend to really like water and moist conditions in soils. 
and they tend to infect roots of trees. They tend to also um, be things that, gra that, that gradually wear down trees. Some of them kill trees quickly, but a lot of them, they do things like consume the fine roots on trees and, and gradually impair water uptake by the trees, and so they have their, they cause their damage over a period of many years. Pitch canker is another very important one that Tom is gonna talk about, so I'll let him address that. And this is just a list of what I've found so far. It's, it's um, just a big list. And some of these might be minor, some might be major. Um, here's a list of thoughts about management, but we're gonna discuss you know, at the end a little more thoroughly. Um, and so we don't really have to go over this exhaustively here. Um, the basic ideas on here are providing for regeneration. In some areas, maybe reducing pests. Figuring out those microsites where decline might not be as big of a problem. So for example, maybe in places that are more well-drained or places that are on a hillside or who knows. Um, reintroducing bishop pine to sites that currently are planted to Monterey pine. Things like that. Just some ideas that I've thrown out there. And that's it. This is a partial list of collaborators. I realize that there are a lot of people missing off this list. Um, after I had already made this up, so I apologize to folks, especially Sea Ranch folks that I didn't put on this list here. But um, Sea Ranch has been a big part of this study, and um, we really appreciate that. Thank you guys. I'm used to being left out, so that's okay. <laughs> um, and, and just um, to follow up a little bit on what Chris said. Um, we have provided access uh, to our community to these research teams, um, and you may see them around. Um, Chris drives a cow fire truck, so um, his is pretty obvious. But there are others. Billboard. <laughs> <laughs> and there are others who uh, uh, may be around um, as well. They've all checked in with our office, and um, we know who they are. Um, I'd like to introduce. Um, our next speaker, who is uh, Tom Gordon. Tom is a uh, professor of plant pathology at UC Davis. Um, and um, I think you will find his presentation to be um, equally um, uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that there are a lot of things uh, going on uh, that all seem to be sort of coming together in a perfect storm of pathogens and, and, <coughs> and things. Tom, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm going to talk about pitch canker, which Chris mentioned briefly. And this is a disease that we've studied for many years. And I'm going to try and touch on the aspects of it that I think might be most relevant to the situation here. Monterey pine is, is the most widely damaged species in California, and the disease typically manifests as multiple points of dieback. Yeah, that's the microphone. <laughs> Each one of these is the result of one or more individual infections, or anywhere you see dying needles or naked tips, at least one infection at that site. And if the infection occurs, on the succulent branch, then you can see the reflect, reflected stem at the top, and that's as a consequence of an infection back here, which you can see on close inspection has the brown and yellow needles. And if you look closely at the stem, you see this accumulation of resin, and that's a defensive response of the tree, but the pitch canker pathogen is, is although the growth is slowed somewhat, it's not inhibited significantly by the presence of the resin. What the resin does, however, is ultimately blocks the flow of water, and so eventually the, the pathogen dies for lack of water. If you pare away the bark, you can see the discolored area, and that's where the pathogen is growing. We can culture from that tissue, and this is the pathogen growing out on a selective medium, and we can identify it based on microscopic characteristics. So that's the name of the pathogen, Fusarium chersonotum. That's the cause of pitch canker in pines. 
it affects many species of pine, also affects Douglas fir, although Douglas fir is not seriously impacted by the disease. So this is the consequence of that infection. It blocks the flow of water, girdles the branch, and everything distal to that point fades and dies. And it's not the only cause, as Chris indicated, of damage to pines. Tip dieback, specifically, common symptom of pitch canker, and can also be caused by gall rust. So in the case of gall rust, if you look back behind the dead needles, instead of finding a mass of resin, you'll find the swelling, which is produced by the tree in response to the presence of the fungus. Another possibility is the podiopinea, and this is a different kind of pathogen because it actually grows inside the tree. It's what we call an endophyte, as in inside the plant. And ordinarily, it causes no damage. It grows throughout the tree. But under some circumstances, probably associated with stress, although it's not always obvious what that stress is, we'll see individual branch tips die. And if you look closely, you can see a purpling of the stem where that occurs. So we see this problem in bishop pine as well as Monterey pine. It, it rarely seems to be a serious problem in either of those species. It's a much more serious problem in some areas in ponderosa pine. And again, presumably because of stress, although it's not always obvious what that stress is. Pitch canker had its origins in the southeast United States. That, that's where the disease was discovered, affecting southern pines and plantations. It's originally identified in Virginia, but it's now known to occur throughout the southeastern United States. It was discovered in California 40 years later by Arthur Cain, who was an extension pathologist at UC Berkeley, mostly associated with planted stands, but we eventually became aware of the fact that it was in all the native populations of Monterey Pine, Cambria, Monterey, and Nuevo, all affected by pitch canker. We have a pretty good idea how it got here from the southeast United States, and that would have been on pine seed, so the white coloration you see there is growth of the fungus on the seed, and here it's growing out on a selected medium. So the pathogen is well known to be seedborne in southern pines, and seedborne also in Monterey pine and Bishop pine. So movement of seed out of an infested area is not a good idea because that is a good possibility of introducing the pathogen to new areas. The reason it came out to California was a consequence of this very curious practice, which is probably still going on today, and that is to ship pine from the east to California and to grow them in nurseries in the seedlings, which are then shipped back to the eastern US for reforestation. As a consequence of that, because some of that seed was contaminated, you get death of some of the seedlings. Here, the fungus is growing at the soil line, and here it's growing down from the seed coat on the cotton leaves. So you get some death in seedlings, but the significant thing for us is that it gave the fungus an opportunity to become established in the soil. So the plate we're looking at here was inoculated with a suspension of soil, and everywhere you see an arrow, that's a colony of the pitch canker fungus. It can survive in soil, and then these nurseries later sowed crops of Monterey pine which can sustain infections, and some of those seedlings die, but many of them remain symptomless, and that's because the fungus can colonize the roots without doing damage. So the one year I put there because we've documented that experimentally, probably it can survive in the roots much longer without necessarily causing symptoms. As a consequence of the ability of the pathogen to grow in the roots, and that's the fungus, shown in the roots of the tree. No symptoms, roots look completely healthy. Consequently, it's possible to ship seedlings that look healthy, but actually are infected by the fungus. And that provided a mechanism for the movement of the pathogen from nurseries to Christmas tree lots. Monterey pine was, and still to some extent, still is very popular as a Christmas tree. Back in the 80s, it was also very popular as a landscape tree. So those trees may become symptomatic at the Christmas tree farm, but some of them that are pre-symptomatic can be sold, or if they're a little bit yellow, they could be touched up with a little green paint. <laughs> <laughs> that 
closed down and some Christmas tree growers admitted that to me because I wouldn't have known about it otherwise. <laughs> so then the tree has served its purpose for the holidays and if it sits outside, it's likely to be visited by beetles that will breed in the tree. And if that tree is infected by the fungus, then as the young eat their way through, they will encounter the fungus and they will emerge carrying pitch canker pathogen to nearby trees. So any landscape pines that are susceptible could become infected. So that provides another mechanism for further distribution of the pathogen. And the insects that emerge carrying the spores of the fungus, these are twig beetles. And as far as the entomologists know, these twig beetles do not have post-maturation feeding, which means they don't need to acquire any nutrients after they emerge. They can go straight to a site where they can breed, where they can deposit eggs. So that suggested that it really wasn't a good vector for the pathogen because it immediately goes to a declining branch. It's not going to infect healthy branches. So what we learned from a series of experiments is that it doesn't always go directly to a declining branch because it can't identify them prior to landing. So it can visually identify something that looks like a branch, but it has to land and it has to taste to find out if it's suitable for tunneling into and creating a gallery. As a consequence of that, it does occasionally go to healthy branches, makes a wound, that wound can become infected, the beetle leaves to find another branch, but ultimately pitch canker develops at that site. So as I said earlier, many infections result in decline of the tree. Sometimes trees die. Usually pitch canker is disfiguring of the tree and weakens it considerably, but usually not by itself a cause of death. So Pinus radiata are very susceptible, but also knobcone pine and bishop pine, near as we can tell, they're all equally susceptible, all of the closed cone pines. And this is approximately the distribution of pitch canker in California, and it's been the case for many years, and we find it along the coast where we have relatively warm temperatures when moisture is present. If you go farther inland, it's too dry, and we have experimental evidence to show the importance of moisture and temperature in limiting the range of pitch canker, at least up to this time. So what is shown here, each one of these <coughs> points corresponds to how frequently infections occur, with this being zero and that 90%. And it looks like a random scatter, but it actually fits a pattern pretty well that corresponds with temperature. So during the winter, when it's cold, we get very few infections. And during the warmer part of the year, infections are much more likely to occur. So that's possible provided that moisture is present, and that is the case in parts of coastal California, where we have fog during the warm months of the year. So our thinking had been that the reason it didn't move north of where we are right here into Mendocino County, notwithstanding the presence of many susceptible trees, Monterey pine, bishop pine in particular, but also short pine, is because when moisture was present, it was too cold for infections to occur. So if temperatures are changing, if, if temperatures are getting warmer over time, then that northern limit may be less applicable. If you are observant and fortunate enough to see an individual infection that is actually the very first one on that tree, and, and in fact the very first one in that area, then pruning it out could, in effect, eliminate the infestation. Because if you make the pruning cut well below the site where resin is present, then that infection is gone. The problem with that approach is that usually by the time we recognize that the disease is there, it's already well established, and there are probably other infected branches that are not yet symptomatic. To test the proposition of eradicated pruning, we did an experiment many years ago in Santa Cruz where we removed all the infected branches that were present in a stand of trees. And we did this in collaboration with Caltrans in a stand where there were 51 trees. Only four of them at the time were symptomatic. We removed all the branches from that tree and then returned at intervals to again remove all the infected branches that were present. And this shows the cumulative number of branches that were removed by the end of the study, just a little shy of 1,200 branches. 
mentioned. So tremendous investment of time and cost to unsuccessfully attempt to eradicate fish cancer. By the end, nearly every tree was infected. So based on that experience and other observations, we can't really recommend pruning as a way to get rid of the disease. The caveat being, if you have a landscape tree and pruning renders that tree aesthetically acceptable, so you don't have to replace the tree, then, then maybe pruning in that case would make sense. Where branches and or trees are removed, we have to be very concerned about that material, a reservoir of the pathogen, and also potentially breeding material for insects. Chipping is very good for preventing that material from being a breeding site for insects. The chips will be too small for the insects to breed in, at least the insects that we have worked with in the case of pitch canker, twig beetles and the greater beetles. The pathogen, however, will survive in the chips. This shows the percent of the chips from which the pathogen was recovered immediately after chipping and this after one year. So viability does decrease over time. This is for four different sites where we did the study. But as you can see, the pathogen is not completely gone even after a year in chipped wood. If it is an option, composting is very effective. A good composting operation will eliminate the pathogen completely. And of course, that means, among other things, that the piles are turned regularly. So all the material is exposed to high temperature. Lower temperatures than that can be effective if for a longer period of time. Logs are another good way to move the pathogen around. Pathogen can survive in the logs. Insects also can survive in the logs. So insects may be transported with the log or may attract local insects that can pick up the fungus and transmit it to local trees. So moving a firewood is a good idea. It is possible to eliminate the pathogen from logs, but only by costly procedures like heat treatment or fumigation with sulfuryl chloride. So the pathogen occasionally kills trees. As I mentioned, usually that would be in association with other forms of stress, especially water stress. But more typically, we see that the disease develops to varying extents. And in some cases, those trees actually do recover from pitch canker. And we know that because we have monitored trees over time. And this is an example from three plots in the Santa Cruz area. And what this shows is the number of trees that were symptomatic, that had symptoms of pitch canker, at the time of monitoring in 1996. And three years later, a subset of those trees no longer had symptoms of pitch canker. And for that to occur, that has to mean, firstly, that the existing infections are gone. And that's what this looks like. So here was an infected tip five years before this picture was taken. And if we look at that from directly underneath the canopy, you can see very clearly what's happened. The tree, and this is true of all trees, they can restrict the development of the pathogen. So it may girdle the branch and kill it distal to that point, but the tree can prevent growth of the pathogen absolutely towards the main stem of the tree. And when that happens, then the subtending branches can take over and no more evidence of infection. So all trees can do that, but for a tree to go into remission, it has to be able to prevent new infections. And that was the, the unexpected part of the story, that these trees, those that showed remission, were no longer getting new infections, even though the pathogen was still present in the area. So that reflects this phenomenon that we call systemic induced resistance. And systemic meaning that it's affected throughout the tree. And it is induced by the prior exposure to the pathogen. So phenomenologically, it's not unlike what we see in warm-blooded animals like us, where we get exposed to a virus, cold or flu virus, and we're no longer susceptible to that strain of the virus. So the biochemical mechanisms are very different in plants, but the outcome is very similar. And to show that this is what was happening, that the trees were in fact more resistant, we inoculated all of those trees that were in remission. And that allows us to have a direct reading of their susceptibility. So this is a susceptible reaction. It was inoculated right here, and all the discolored area is where the pathogen is growing. This is a resistant reaction, so that's the site of inoculation, and the tree was able to contain it 
within that area or only very limited expansion. So when we set up these plots, of course, we weren't thinking about where the branches were relative to the ground. We were just observing them when we needed to inoculate them. We had to use a bucket truck. And I thought it was important for me to stay on the ground and take pictures as <laughs> <laughs> inoculating branches. So we inoculated them, went back later, removed the branches, and measured the lesion. So this is the length of that discolored area. And the dotted line corresponds more or less to a threshold of what we would call resistance. Because if the lesion doesn't get any longer than this, then it's not going to be able to grow the branch, and so you will not see any symptoms of disease, and that's what we call resistance. So this is a control tree outside the area just to demonstrate that the inoculum is effective in inducing lesions. So we reasoned that if this <coughs> phenomenon was occurring, that it should be true that trees in areas where the disease was present for a longer period of time should be overall more resistant than trees where the disease was more recently introduced. So we tested that by inoculating trees in plots that corresponded to the different residence time of the pathogen, greater than 10 years versus two years <coughs> or less. And what we saw was that on average, the lesions were twice as long in the new areas. So again, evidence that trees are more resistant as a result of exposure to the pathogen. So we think this phenomenon has been significant in terms of the course of pitch panther on the Monterey Peninsula, which is where we have the longest history of the disease. And what this shows is a measure of severity of disease based on the number of infected branches and stem infections. And what you can see is that the severity increased steeply from the start, 1996 to 1999. And oddly, and just by coincidence, this is where we published the paper. And we imagined that um, the future was going to look like that. But surprisingly, no, it plateaued. And in fact, if you go back to most of those plots, you can't find the disease. It has literally disappeared. Now, I think that induced resistance has a lot to do with that. I think another part of it may be a much less frequent occurrence of thaw in those areas, so not providing moisture required for infection. So all that pertains to Pinus radiata. We know less about bishop pine because it hasn't been affected nearly to the same extent. But we have been looking at it in the Point Reyes area. And here you may know there was a fire, 1995, in this area. And it replaced the stands completely. As a consequence of that, there was regeneration on a large scale. In fact, the bishop pine forest expanded tremendously. A lot of grassland area became forested. And the stands were extremely dense. They looked great for about the next 10 years. And at that point, you started to see evidence of dieback. And this is a picture that was taken by the park ecologist from the same vantage point two years later you could see a tremendous amount of death. So we established plots at Point Reyes in 2009 to get a better understanding of how the disease was developing. All of these were burn areas, so very dense stands. And then we also had plots in the more open areas, typical of the Bishop Pine Forest before the fire. And what we saw was that in both the dense and open areas, the disease was increasing over time, both as measured by the incidence, so this is just the number of trees that have any infections in the open and in the dense areas. The dense areas are lower overall because we intentionally picked areas where the disease was either not there or at only at a low level, but in proximity to infected trees. So we would have more time to get a reading on development. So we saw a similar pattern with respect to severity. So this is a measure of the intensity of the disease in individual trees based on number of infections. And likewise here, we see the disease becoming more severe over time. So it's very clear from the numbers, but the impact is captured much more effectively with pictures. If you look at hillsides, you can see a tremendous number of trees are dead. And many of those that aren't are symptomatic and probably are, are on the way to mortality as well. And this is another picture. Now, I said earlier, pitch canker by itself doesn't usually kill trees. 
So most likely something else is at work here. And the most likely factor would be water stress. Because of the density of those stands, there would be on the order of a million stems per hectare. So clearly not sustainable. And the combination of pitch canker and water stress is probably the primary reason that so many trees are dying. And that lines up very well with what we saw in Monterey Pine in the Santa Cruz area. Most of the trees, thousands, probably tens of thousands of trees died mostly in the Santa Cruz area along freeway rights of way, and that occurred, most of that mortality occurred during a four-year drought. So for that reason, it's tempting to think that thinning is a good management practice where that is an option, something that can bring the transpirational demand more in line with the available water supply. And that has been done in some areas, like on the Huckleberry Hill, area in Pebble Beach where they had a fire in 1987 and we don't have a control to say that it's because of the thinning but indeed where the thinning was done the disease is not a problem. So a few thoughts about managing a problem like pitch canker although I think this is applicable to exotic problems in general that we can take advantage in many cases of genetic variation and susceptibility and heritable genetic variation is what natural selection acts on. And we know this is true for Monterey Pine. We have less evidence, but evidence indicative of the same level of variation in Bishop Pine. And this is what we call a normal distribution. So these are region-like categories, and this is the number of trees in that category, and this is a seedling population. And what it shows is, like with height in humans, most are intermediate, we have some on the far end of susceptibility and some that are highly resistant. So it's a nice level of variation, and that's something that natural selection can act on, and, and we would expect over time, and of course we're talking about long periods of time here, decades, maybe more, that the population would become enriched for those genotypes that are more resistant to the disease, and for that reason, Promoting regeneration is a good practice if that's an option to provide an opportunity for reproduction and the development of seedlings that represent novel genetic combinations. And, and that's really the key, is the genetic combinations. Not a gene for resistance, but a combination of genes that's well adapted to the area. And so that includes not just a particular exotic pathogen that's causing problems, but all the other factors that influence the success of an individual. And that's why this strategy is far superior to going in and selecting individual trees and taking seed from them or cuttings. But it will be happening um, in the upcoming year. So I'd like to take the last little bit of time we have, and if we run over a little bit, that's fine. But um, if, we, if people have questions, our distinguished panel is here. Uh, in order to get you on the video and so forth, I'm going to move over to the hand mic at the piano, and if you'll come up to the corner of the room there where I'm standing and ask your questions with the microphone, um, everybody can hear, and we'll get it recorded. Just like magic. <laughs> Crowd coming up over the lead. If you tell us who you are and just um, address the panel, thanks. My name is Barry Weiss, 3113. And um, maybe I missed it, but there wasn't any mention of the cypress trees. Are they uh, just, uh, resistant, or did, are they not diseased at this present time? Or is, is there something we should know about them? Because we have quite a few of them, and we've been replanting a lot of them, too. Yeah, that question came up yesterday, too, and I was talking to Leslie about it. Um, Cypress problems are caused by um, other pathogens, typically, and I um, don't know much about the extent of it on Sea Ranch, so Leslie is going to take me and show me after this talk some of it, and I'll maybe take some samples and see if I can grow anything out of it, and maybe report back to you in the future on that. Um, in other parts of California, uh, there is a, a a big problem with some planted cypress is called cypress canker, caused by a completely different pathogen. Um, whether that's the sort of thing we're dealing with here or not, um, I don't know yet. Thanks. 
Judy Johnson, and um, I really appreciate the focus on the short-term and reactive focus on safety, but what was startling to me earlier was the fact that just, that there's an issue with potentially removing and moving, right? And so when we, when we remove these dead and dying trees that are infected, what, what are you doing with them? I mean, the, the chipping and putting them back to the soil doesn't seem like the best solution. So what's the short-term approach to really removing? Is there one? Right, that, I mean, that's something we need to investigate further. Obviously, we pick up these trees and we chip them, and um, for some pathogens, it's okay to do that. Um, but I think that we need to look into it further and come up with some good strategies for making sure that we're doing it right. Definitely. But Leslie, yeah. I think we heard recently that uh, composting actually yeah. appears to be yeah. a very good way of sequ sequestering yeah. uh, CO2. Yeah, and we have space to do something like that, so I would like to look more into, you know, a giant compost pile somewhere <coughs> that the crew can work with. Well, my name is Phil Kubman. I live at the end of Comfort Close, and there seems to be conditions down there that uh, I've asked questions about and don't seem to get answers that satisfy me. And it's, there's a lichen that's growing uh, on uh, both willow trees on my property and uh, on the pine trees. On the willow trees, which I know are loaded with water, the lichen doesn't seem to have any um, real negative effect. On the pine trees, however, uh, especially at the end of conifer close where these, they have very large conifers, the lichen is growing on these trees. And it, people tell you that it doesn't affect the trees, but those trees are dying. There's no leaves, there's no needles on them or anything else. I, mean, I haven't heard anybody really substantially uh, address that that problem and, and, and see if there is an effect of the lightning on the uh, these definitely these trees. And I would recommend that somebody from the association go down there and look at the uh, end of the front of the because these trees are going to be a problem. They're very large, and uh, if they're dying, they're both on the commons uh, around uh, the uh, street and on private property. So uh, I would recommend that, and I would like to talk to you further about it. Sure. Thank you. Well, I don't know if Tom wants to, to say anything about that. My understanding has always been that lichens are more of a, a, a symptom of, uh, in other words, Trees die first, and then lichens like to grow there because there is increased sunlight that gets through that, that tree crown to allow them to grow there, and not that they are having the deleterious effect. But I don't know if Tom has any more insight. No, I, I would reinforce that. And, and of course, it's always possible there are things happening that you don't know about, right? But there's not a precedent for it. But we tend to think of lichens as being secondary. Well, there's. I, I could understand why you might say that, that the tree died in the lichen grew. I have a tea tree also on my property. And the lichen was growing on that tree. I took the sample up to the uh, nursery, and they told me just take the lichen off the tree because it would hurt the experience of the person I was talking to was that they had a fruit tree that lichen got on. And the lichen started having a negative effect on the, on the fruit tree. So I went out there and I, by, by hand, took all the lichen off the tea tree. And what a difference. The thing has so many flowers right now is amazing. And so, I, you know, to say that the lichen grows on a dead tree is, it may be true, but, but the, the tree is dead. And uh, when you take it off of some trees, the, the tree will come back. So. Okay. Next. Good morning, Carolyn Leonard. It's my 50th year coming up to the ranch. So I've seen a lot of changes, but I really appreciate your expertise here today and taking the time to educate us. I think citizen science has a big future. Put us to work, help, uh, help us to help you. I have photographs of my unit block from 50 years ago. It doesn't look anything like it. 
covered with junk trees. I used to have 190 degree view. Now I have just a few degrees. The trees are sick. You know, I don't know what influence that'll have on other plants or other animals. You know, that have come to the ranch. Uh, we know it's a very complex issue. So, if uh, there's some capacity for the project going forward to capture a longer term history of what's happened here, my unit is to look like the north end of the ranch looks now. And that's what I bought, that's what I wanted. Um, I have experience as a fire commissioner, and that's not what I have now. And it's nothing I can control because it's not on my property with the help of a committee that will let me remove trees. It's much more general, it's much more about the uh, commons. And uh, if I had a question for you, it would be uh, just to send up a flare of caution on cloned plant material. There was encouraging news there on the diversity that needs to happen. Um, and no easy fix here, but please uh, note that clone material that you're going to plant, oh, don't plant anything. We, we tried that, it didn't work 50 years ago. Um, so that was a big mistake, you know, it was an experiment. So those are not direct questions to you, but encouragement, gratitude, and um, inspiration, and hopefully you can use our experience and our uh, insight and our observations to help you. Thanks very much. Can I respond to that, uh, Frank? Sure. Uh, you, you are touching on, on issues that are, are frequent uh, subjects of our uh, design committee uh, discussions. And uh, as you can see, this is a really complex uh, situation. Uh, we're not quite sure uh, what's going to happen, and we're not quite sure what kind of uh, uh, communities uh, would make sense uh, in the future. And along with that, we have our, we have our uh, human values like liking the views that we had 50 years ago. And uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, this is something that's going to have to be worked out uh, in the interim on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, hopefully coming up with compromises that um, do not impede the uh, progress, hopefully uh, um, based on selection of uh, recovery of the ecosystem. Uh, and at the same time are satisfactory to, uh, to homeowners. And obviously, in addition to that, we have the goals of the uh, Common Landscape, Commons Landscape Committee, like the Commons Landscape uh, Committee work. And um, those also may have to change uh, based on, on uh, what uh, <coughs> the, uh, our sort of master, you could call it a master landscape, uh, master vegetation plan. And clearly, no matter what plan we come up with, it's always going to be something in flux. So. Very dynamic um, situation and opportunity. Just two words, defensive space, vegetation management. The fire team needs to be on, uh, worked with as well, right. cooperated with right. and um, meeting their needs because the yeah, ideas are nice, but fire protection is my main concern. Tom Cochran here. Um, Why don't you give us uh, an idea of the the expected age of these trees? I mean, when we look at redwoods, we're looking at uh, maybe thousands of years of age, but a lot of these trees are, are, are at their maturity now, and that has to certainly have a big effect on the uh, susceptibility to disease. As we get older, we get diseases. <laughs> so uh, I don't have a good feel for these different types of trees we're talking about and what there is, what's their average expected age? So could somebody give us a quick uh, thought on that? I don't know if you want me to answer that because um, I have looked at the literature on it and um, the sort of academic answer that scientists are actually coming up with is that for many trees, there is no programmed uh, death age. What there is though is trees grow in various environments and different trees have better or, or not so great defenses against the environmental stress. 
that they experience. And so, like you said, those stresses accumulate over years. And I think most people, I don't know, for Bishop Pines, what I hear people say is, if you've got a 100 or 120 year old tree, that that's a really old Bishop Pine. Monterey Pines, do you have any thoughts about those? Yes, yeah, Monterey Pine would be right in the same line. 120 years would be considered something close to the maximum age. But, but as Chris was saying, it depends very much on, on where you grow them. So what I'm describing would be in the native range of Monterey Pine. If you move it into a warmer area, the life expectancy is much shorter. Thank you. My name is Vicki Leeds. Um, I'm concerned about trees on my property. In January, there was one tree that didn't look good. Um, I wasn't up here by March. There was one dead tree and three dying trees. To, um, when I came up yesterday, it was shocking. There's at least 10 dead trees. So, so in managing this, do I just take out all the trees because it's obviously spreading, even the ones that still look So are these pine trees that you're talking about? They're pines, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really in line with what I've been seeing. When I go down to Salt Point State Park, for example, um, some of the stands I'm looking at down there, it seems like they're falling apart month um, by month. Yeah, is it, I mean, it's shocking. I haven't been here in two and a half weeks, and it was just shocking the difference. And I, I mean, unfortunately, I can't give good answers because I don't know all those causes. Um, you know, if, if pitch canker were the only problem, we could maybe give you a better recommendation, but um, we don't know all of the range of things that is going on. Well, yeah. this yeah, so somebody that like can look at the trees. Yeah, definitely. Email me or give me a call. I can come over and get you at your property. And most likely, the the answer will be just to react the way the association is and just remove everything. dead trees. We're not removing dying trees just because maybe there's a chance that they're going to make it. But when it's totally dead for fuel, you know, fire issues, but we removed it. I mean, one of the things that you could see from Tom's presentation is that some pathogens could kill dozens of branches on the tree, and it might look absolutely horrible, and you would assume it's about to die, but it, it won't necessarily. Um, uh, other, other pathogens, you know, it could be declined very slowly, but it is eventually going to die. It's, it's really hard to know what's, what's going on. Hopefully in the future we can suss out the patterns a little bit better. Okay, anybody else? I'd, I'd like to just um, sure. Sure, um, segue to that, to your, to your comments. Uh, this is Bill B. Meyer's windshield survey, uh, uh, taken from, uh, from Highway 1. <clears throat> and I think it, it brings to mind the importance of citizen input. Of, uh, uh, helping uh, fill the database uh, from sites like yours, if everyone were to, you know, um, look for the symptoms that, that uh, Tom and Chris have, have uh, uh, identified, and then um, to report them to Leslie, probably, yeah. uh, then it would really help a lot to get a, a, an accurate picture of the distribution of, of the, different, uh, the different problems. And for now, I can, I'm recording this into this app that Alexis was talking about. And so our goal is to eventually have it so everyone can participate. But the fact is right now, I'm doing it, John Prescott's doing it, and Rick Craig, the crew leader, is doing it. Um, so we're happy to take your information as well, and I can update. We want a lot of data. It would be great. It would make Alexis happy, too. <laughs> OK. Well, uh, we didn't run too far over. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for coming. We had about 140 last night. We have about 60 here today. Um, so um, we will have uh, videos available again uh, um, sometime later next week for people who were not able to attend. But I personally appreciate you giving up your Saturday morning uh, to come talk to us uh, uh, about these issues. They're very critical as, as and very complex, as you can see today. So. Um, thanks again, and um, um, I guess we're done. I'd like to thank our distinguished panel, Leslie, Alexis, Tito,
Chris and Tom, and uh, give them another round of applause.